Good morning to everyone in Hyderabad. How's the sound? Hi, Gerardo. It's sounding our great. Adriana, how are you? Good. Very excited to be here. Ariadna, hola. Hola, Lorraine. ¿Cómo estás? <laughs> Muy bien. Qué bueno. Super bien. We are ready. We're listos. Listo. Right. Hey, you there? How are you? <laughs> Should we just go ahead and start? Well, it's your call. How's how's the crowd over in the session room? Uh, it's a huge crowd. <laughs> I thought you would be so surprised. There you go. I was just waiting for the actual presentation. <laughs> um, well, let us just wait for for the introduction. Uh, yeah. Do you want us to start? I can start. Absolutely. So we're good to go. Awesome. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here in our presentation about breaking the barrier, reaching out to Latin American students. So isn't it interesting that we're all the way here in Hyderabad talking about Latin America? You know, that's how international this is. So my, it is my honor. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Lorraine Castañares, and I work as the school engagement manager for Latin America for Navitas, but I also serve as the co-chair for the Latin American Committee for IC3. And here with us, we have like two very important people in my life, my friends, and uh, we have Gerardo de Vega, who's the college counselor for Country Day School in Costa Rica. Hi, Gerardo. Hello, hello, Lorraine, and hello, everyone in Hyderabad. I hope your uh, morning has started quite enthusiastically. Thank you, Gerardo. And not only that, he's also the chair for the Latin American Committee uh, for IC3. And we also have Ariadna Sashteva, who works at Royal Roads University in beautiful British Columbia. Ariadna, how are you today? I am so happy, Lorraine. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, my experience with you. I want to say that I am in Canada right now. Uh, it's uh, almost it's 8.30 p.m. here, but I have all the energy to be sharing in this panel. And I also want to say that I'm originally from Cuba, so happy to share the experience from Canada and from Cuba. So Ariadna is also part of the Latin American Committee for IC3. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let's start. So uh, Gerardo, would you like to start with defining the barrier? Sure thing. Well, do we have uh, the PPT on screen? Please? It is on screen, my friend. Yes. All right. Okay. Okay, and there's Josh. Hi, Josh. <laughs> Hi, hello to uh, everyone um, online. Go ahead, Gerardo. Go ahead. Yes, uh, just a little problem. Our feed. I'm only seeing a desktop presentation. So could you maybe duplicate, please? Can somebody help me over here to duplicate the presentation? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Is that okay, uh, Gerardo? A little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. We can just give us a second because we online we can't see the PPT. Okay. Um, so let us just wait a moment until they can share the actual presentation. Hi, Joshua. So good to see you. Hey, Josh, buddy, how's everything? Hello, everyone. It's good. It's great. I'm sorry for this. I'm so happy to be here. Abrazo, Joshua. As always, abrazo. Yes. Abrazo for you, my yes. friend. Yes, muchas. So I guess we just need to share the PowerPoint presentation in the Zoom so everyone that is online can see it. 
Yes, exactly. Right now we're looking, I think it's Lorraine's desktop. Yeah. So if you give me the USB, I can put it here or, I mean, this is the easiest way. Um, I can't unplug anything or it will go, you know, I, there's no USB port. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why don't you guys open the presentation, Gerardo, and perhaps we can start yeah. talking about it. It's a, it's a nice group and we'll have a nice conversation. You'll see. All right. Okay. Not a problem. Okay. So if you give me the uh, moderator power, I can share. Okay. Here it is. There you go. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Okay, you're ready? Yes, let's go back one, please. It's not too much. Okay. Trouble. Okay. There we go. We're ready. Excellent. Get out of the okay, way. well, thank you very much and welcoming to uh welcome to breaking the barrier, you know, reaching out to the Latin American student. Now, it is really important to first understand that when we're talking about Latin America, we're talking about a diverse and a culturally rich region. Uh, so re university reps will have different experiences throughout Latin America, going up, you know, starting all the way in Mexico, going all the way down to Peru. Um, and it's going to be quite different. Uh, you're going to be different types of uh, students, different types of uh, needs, and different types of personalities. However, there are some common themes, and there are many challenges within the Latin American region, and many challenges that the high school students will be facing. Okay, Now, we have pinpointed the most important ones, and these for us are those key elements, those areas of interaction that basically draw up what a Latin American student is, and how we're going to be able to you know, break that, okay? Um, the first one is the that we're, we're gonna have a huge difference in the educational system. Many of the educational systems are led through government initiatives. That means that we're gonna be having two types of systems, uh, as you can see at the very end of the first point, the public education system and the private education system. Uh, and they're gonna vary greatly in quality curriculum and resources, okay? Now we have students that have very limited access to advanced courses, co-curricular activities, and we have others that have been, uh, the, that are more privileged in these educational experiences. The second point that it's really important to understand and to uh, be able to grasp is the fact that we will be having financial constraints Okay, again, between that public system and that private system, we're going to be having um, students that have financial obstacles throughout the Latin American region in order to be able to pursue higher education, uh, university tuition, you know, books, costs, trans transportation, housing. Uh, this can be a very limiting factor for many family, families. That is why many governments have their own uh, government institution or ministry of education, Secretaria, uh, you name it, in which, you know, scholarships, grants, and loans are available, and they may be accessible. Uh, in other cases, it may not be so. And so it's really important to understand that when we're dealing with, you know, the region, we will be dealing with a diverse set of students. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, so I also want to add, so guys, we're talking of a about a totally different ecosystem here. This is a good way of looking at it. As Gerardo said, the difference between public and private education is pretty evident. And uh, as university representatives, we kind of tend to uh, address the needs of those in the private sector, uh, because those are the students who are really looking to study abroad. Um, Ariadna, can you tell me more about points three and four, please? Yeah, could you please um, help me? So um, point three refers to how we select students. Um, 
Um, so students face many challenges in selecting, of course, the right university and the right program for their aspirations. Um, the access to information is very, it's very broad. So there are so many different universities, what program to choose, what career path. Um, it's not always easy for students um, to have this, um, especially for those students that uh, come from, um, from marginalized communities, especially um, those communities that are not usually in the capitals of the countries. So they have so um, little access to information, uh, little access to the main um, activities that recruiters go to, for instance, the, uh, the um, um, recruitment fairs is very limited. Um, so um, that's, that's, that's another limitation for these students. Um, the language barrier is another limitation um, Spanish and Portuguese are the main um, languages in this um, region. And some of the university programs require that students have proficiency in English or in another language, uh, mainly English, French as well in, in Canada. So students who, have, who, don't, who don't have the language, um, it could be difficult for them to access uh, these programs. Another point is the cultural transition. Um, uh, it's not only, it's, it's, it's hard to transition from high school to university. Um, it's two different ways of, of learning and also the cultural uh, shift. Sometimes um, when students come to the United States or to Canada or to another um, country in the region, that cultural difference um, it's also evident, and of course, it is not easy to navigate. Thank so you. So next slide. Thank you so much, Ayana. So yes. So what is this barrier we're talking about? Right. We came here because we want to know how to surpass this barrier. So um, let's go on to the next points. Gerardo, would you like to tell us about the next points? Sure thing. So going down the list, we have social or family expectations. Let us remember that in America is a very or rather conservative um, region and that family values are really important. So you will be facing many Latin American students in which the, you know, the grandfather had a profession, the father, the son, uh, they even go to the same school. They work within the same community. They inherit the family business. So these cultures, these expectations basically pave the way for these choices, okay? And students will be feeling that pressure to be able to pursue these traditional careers and to be able to go down what is known as those stable, prestigious, money-making careers, okay? So again, you know, the, 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 the clash between what the student is passionate about and what the family is asking for. After that, many uh, schools have limited access to support and services. They don't have academic advising. They don't have career college counseling. They don't even have mental health resources. Um, and therefore, you know, paving that road or keep on paving the road to the university will have impact in the student's abilities to navigate uh, the challenges that they're gonna be facing. It's really important to understand that, you know, how the student articulates different these different areas is quite important and will have repercussions. The following one is quite important, gender and diversity. We still are seeing, and according to uh, the World Economic Forum and one of the uh, studies that they did in the Latin American region post-COVID, the gender gap increased from 150 years to 250 years. So this means that it's going to take 250 years to have equity between men and women in the Latin American region. So female students you know, or students from marginalized gender identities might encounter unique challenges. And this will include stereotyping, societal pressures that could affect their career and university choices. Thank you, Gerardo. But from our side, what does this mean, right? When we talk about social and family expectations, how does that translate, like, for instance, at a fair 
in our job. So for in, uh, one of the things I can think about is in a relationship where we have somebody who has power and somebody who doesn't have power, it is very important to see that uh, whereas some students, let's say in the United States, feel that they're being chosen by the university, that puts the university in a place of power, you know. Um, in Latin America, the student has this feeling or men mindset that they are choosing the university. In terms of socially, social and family expectations, customer service, you know, how we address the parents, how we address the families right then and there is very different, right? Because they expect all this attention to be put to them because they think, or the families think that they are the ones who are making this choice. So I think we, we're gonna analyze some of these cultural differences. Okay, thank you. Ariadna, let's go on for the next slide. Thank you. Okay. Yes, other factors um, that can be taken into consideration and if we can go to the next slide, please. Yes, there it is. Oh no, the yeah. one before that? Yeah, there it is, there it is. Go ahead. So ahead. Latin America is poised with um, a political, social and economic climate um, that is not advantageous all the time for students. And this economic instability um, can impact um, their studies abroad. And um, um, it's, it's something that we have to take into consideration all the time. Also, the connection uh, to the internet and access to technology, um, it's not equal for everyone. There are students that don't have access to the internet or to an, or a stable internet connection. So this makes, makes it difficult for students to take, for instance, um, online courses or have access, more access to information. Um, access to research, to the most up-to-date research, and to communicate with other peers. So this is another thing that we have to take into consideration. However, however, all of these factors that we've mentioned, and I'm sure you um, can also share more, um, there is also, we, we've noticed that Latin American students um, are very resilient. They are determined. Um, to grow in their career, um, to seek for more information, to grow as human beings. And they do have a strong desire to pursue higher education and improve their circumstances. So that's why we're here. And that's why we, we want to open um, a discussion on what we can do as IC3 movement um, to help them uh, move forward. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ariana. Absolutely. So I also love this like last paragraph that Ariana just mentioned, you know, like it is true that we have all these barriers, but it is also true that these barriers have made Latin American students very resilient, very determined, very focused on finding a better future, which I think is very valuable uh, from our perspective. And they will do whatever it takes to find, you know, opportunities to improve their lives. Okay, yes, um, Gerardo, please go ahead with the next slide. So in summary, you know, what are you facing? So you're gonna be facing the LATAM student, but you're gonna be facing two parallel realities, okay? Now, for those of you who have already had experiences throughout the region, the good, the, the good news for you guys is that you have, been facing the right side of the reality, private institutions, okay? Uh, so if we have a, a comparison between these private institutions and public institutions, definitely the private, the private institutions have better resources uh, versus the limited ones for public institutions. Private institutions high, have high socioeconomic background. Public institutions do have a diverse student body. You've been talking about, you know, uh, indigenous uh, people from different communities, rural areas, uh, very traditional families. Uh, private institutions have even international students. Uh, CDS, for example, where I work, 60% of the student body is international. So our student, Costa Rican student body, or our LATAM student body, has a lot of contact with students from the US, Canada, uh, UK, and uh, some other countries. 
there are more ne networking opportunities because of how fares are articulated for private institutions versus those uh, public institutions. Um, there's a English language proficiency versus the barriers that the public institutions have. The private institutions do have pressure for academic performance uh, versus the limited one, which has a limitation in these advanced courses, these additional courses or college level courses even. And finally, private institutions have a really strong university preparation versus the limited career and university guidance the public institutions have. So it's two, to the, both sides of the coin, two uh, parallel realities, and they're totally opposite one to the other one. Okay. So the important thing here is how do we start to articulate? How do we start to level the playing field so that university reps may not only reach private institutions, but at some point start reaching public institutions? And fair enough, it may be a smaller amount of students, but reaching those that have high potential and those that may excel in these public institutions. Thank you very much, Gerardo. Another example I can come up with is the concept of what a scholarship means in my context in Mexico City. You know, like we might think a scholarship is something that is given to somebody, you know, by merit or by need, but um, Sometimes in these private institutions, a scholarship is something that students really want for prestige, right? And what we think about as a scholarship in Mexico, you know, some of the national universities and in, in private national universities, um, they give scholarships of 70%, 80%, scholarships that will make a difference in the choice that is being made. So it is very important that when we address our families and the students and the Latin American communities, we kind of go with this mindset of even explaining what is a co-op, you know, what is an acceptance rate, things that we might assume that families, parents, students already know, but perhaps we have to over explain ourselves in a way, so that we even, what do we mean by scholarship? Because even a concept that might be, you might think is universal, has its nuances depending on the region and even depending on the country. So, uh, and what it means to a family. As I said, some very uh, wealthy families from private institutions are looking for a scholarship because it's prestige and not what will make the difference in terms of uh, financial aid. Okay, um, Ariadna, tell us, let's, uh, hold on, here we go. Yes, yes we I were talking that, about, to... yeah, we were talking about both sides of the coin, um, the difference between um, public institutions and private institutions, students, but what we found out is that um, in both sides of the coins, there are shared experiences. So, Students from private and public institutions, they both have aspirations to access higher education. Uh, they both have faced challenges with access. Um, they both share the cultural richness. They are both determined and resilient. Um, they have expectations in society that they want to um, overcome a goal, like they want to achieve a goal. Um, and in general, um, our high school students from Latin America, whether they be in public or private institutions, they, they have um, to navigate a complex educational landscape, as we were talking about, um, that sometimes lack resources, that have socioeconomic factors that are not always easy, um, that are um, culturally diverse. And while the challenges exist, um, they have a strong drive to overcome these obstacles and they want to pursue higher education to improve their futures and those of their communities. So okay. this is what we found and um, we would like now to open the floor for discussion. Thank you so much. Ayala. Yes, so one of the things that we can think about like from our institution's point of view is like when we're budgeting, right? how much we're going to allot to the Latin American region, 
if we take into consideration that we have these uh, challenges with access, financial challenges for families, et cetera, what kind of scholarship, I have an invitation for us to look for special scholarships for Latin American students, right? that are embedded within what a scholarship means in the culture and that will open access to students who might not have access to international education otherwise. So yes, we're gonna start with our panel discussion. This is a little bit more like the informal part of this uh, uh, experience. And so here we are. So I'm the moderator because I'm here in person. Uh, we have Ariadna and Gerardo online and uh, so we have these questions that we, we would like to uh, share with you. So out of these 10 barriers that were discussed at the very beginning, 10 barriers, right? Which of these barriers, um, Gerardo, Ariadna, or anyone in the audience, which of these barriers do you think could be taken down or could actually be addressed? Like I'm thinking political, uh, upheaval is not necessarily a, one of the, the, the barriers that we could take down, but which of these barriers could we take down? Uh, Gerardo, could you share what you think, please, my friend? Sure thing. Um, I want to start with first giving a context uh, of what's happening here in Costa Rica. So at the educational level, I've had many conversations with the Ministry of Education, um, government-related institution for, for, you know, that articulates um, high school education, well, all the school education and even university education. One of the biggest problems, and this is something that started when they, when the government started implementing IB, was the fact uh, that they had to train the teachers. So one of the recent studies has shown that in order to be able to have a teacher from a public institution trained for IB and having the skills of a teacher that belongs to the private institution they're gonna need more or less 15 years. So my point being is that as university representatives, okay, when we're reaching out to private institutions, we won't be feeling that gap, okay? Uh, it won't be felt basically because uh, the, the, the private institution is up to par with what's happening at the international level. However, if a, uh, a university, international university is reaching out to a public institution or into the government, the first thing is understanding uh, that there is a, a educational gap there. It's a big one. And therefore they have to better, or they have to articulate adequately in order to be able to reach this crowd, okay? To be able to bring out the talent within the public institution and therefore to be able to strategically, you know, uh, present themselves. Uh, Lorraine, you said something quite interesting a couple of minutes ago, and it's about the branding, that marketing part. So it's a lot about not only reaching the student, but reaching the family. I've had multiple conversations with university reps in which they ask, well, if we go to your school, are we going to be meeting parents? Probably yes, one or two, but they won't come in. Okay. When will they come in? when they schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the university rep. And it's gonna be the mom, the dad, the student, probably the little brother. And if they, if they, if, and if it's allowed, they're gonna bring in their parakeet paco, okay? Because that's how they work, okay? That's the mentality. And that mentality, you will see it not only in public institutions, but you will see it in private institutions. I've had many reps that tell me, you know, I, I met with a family. And when I say I met with a family, oh my God, it was the entire family. Okay, so that structure, that traditional structure is embedded there. Okay, so that marketing, that being able to reach these families and being able to understand these gaps, educational gaps, because of limitations within the different governments is important to better articulate and to better reach out to the, to the student body in the Latin American region. And to manage expectations, right, Gerardo? To manage expectations, like for instance, how many calls will it take me to get one of a, a student in Latin America, you know, to become part of our, my university? Perhaps in other regions that is two calls. Perhaps in Latin America it will require five to seven calls because of the cultural differences. 
Um, thank you. Ariadna, what, what do you think are some of the barriers that we could take down in your experience? Uh, yes, Lorraine. I think um, as a university representative, uh, one of the barriers that we could take down um, is the access to information. Um, the pandemic showed us that um, the virtual world uh, can reach out to so many more students. Um, usually as university representatives, when we travel um, to Latin America to recruit students, uh, we usually travel to the capitals of each country. Um, sometimes we go to other um, main cities in the country, but not we cannot reach out to all the cities in the country. However, with the pandemic, we noticed that um, participating in virtual fairs, um, the amount of students we could reach out um, the places we could reach out, it expanded amazing, exponentially. It was amazing. So now we have in our student body um, students from cities that we never imagined. So I think um, access to information, participating in virtual fairs will give the opportunity to those students from communities that are far from capitals in, the, in their countries to have access to the information about the university and about the different options they have of education. So also sharing the information through social media. That's another uh, way of um, breaking the barrier of the information. Sharing the information in Instagram, in Facebook, in TikTok, WhatsApp, and any other platform that is available for students. I think it's a very good way um, to break the barrier um, against the lack of information. So this is one of the barriers, so more access to information. Another barrier that we could take down is access to funding and how we can do that. Um, as you said before, um, you, we usually, um, unfortunately, we focus on, um, you, on high schools that are private because we think that those students have the uh, means to um, study at a university abroad. However, uh, we found out that if we give information to students that don't have all the financial um, needs covered, but we pair with other um, organizations, say a, um, a local government, a provincial government, a federal government, a non-governmental organization, if we pair with those and we work in triangle, um, so many students can um benefit from that. So at my university, we work with local governments, as I said before, but we also work with uh, other funding institutions like, for instance, CONAPE in Costa Rica, ICETEX in Colombia, IFARU in Panama, MESID in the Dominican Republic, Fundacion Beca, and many others in Mexico. So reaching out to these institutions, um, having agreements with these institutions, to bring students from different parts of, of, of the country and, and being funded by, the, by their governments, by the local governments or provincial governments is a great way to break the barrier uh, for funding. So these are the two barriers I, I, I um, discovered, but I have others. I don't know if Gerardo wants to talk yeah. about any other one before I talk to other ones. Thank you, yeah, I mean, Gerardo. I, I could. Yes, sorry, sorry for interruption. I could mention one that's really, um, really interesting here in Costa Rica, and I do know that that one's replicated throughout the region, and it wasn't in our uh, ten most important barriers, but it's the geographical one. Um, so when when I have conversations with university reps, and they ask, well, could you more or less give us some sort of you know enlighten us where which school, schools to visit, and I give them the name of our school. And they're like, okay, how far uh, away is that school from CDS? I may tell them, you know, 10, 12 kilometers. They're like, oh, great. It's going to be maybe a 20 minute ride. I'm like, uh, no, not really. It's going to be maybe an hour, an hour and a half. And they're like, what? Are you kidding me? I'm like, unfortunately, I'm not. So I've had conversations with universities in which I've told them, look, you know, if, you know, um, if you can't go to the mountain, have the mountain come to you. And so I've already had experiences with the universities. Instead of visiting schools, they come in, they set up, you know, shop at a hotel, and they just invite people. So it's easier to articulate. Students come in, you know, from 
other schools that are not in the greater metropolitan area um, and co haven't come in to, for, here, uh, for example, here in Costa Rica, to San Jose and visit the hotel and talk to the rep and, you know, have that networking time, then having the rep moving from one school to the other. And now, and why is this? Because right now we gave two scenarios, but we haven't given numbers. So I'm going to give the Costa Rica number so that you guys more or less may visualize what's happening. So in the educational system, okay, in the uh, high school educational system, Costa Rica has over 4,000 or 5,000, uh, it's a little bit less, around 3,000 uh, high schools, okay? Those are public and private. Out of those 3,000 plus high schools, more or less, uh, less than a third are private, okay? And now these private have different types of curriculum. Most of them are not international. So out of those, let's say 500, uh, 600 uh, high schools, you're talking maybe 20 to 30, more or less, or maybe a little more, let's say 50 uh, high schools that are international high schools that have the IB program uh, or have APs or you know have a GCSEs or something like that, okay? So the numbers do decrease quite drastically and exponentially when we're talking about reaching these groups. Fair enough, economically, these are the groups that may pay for tuition. But again, as Ariana just articulated, if the university reps basically link up with government, many times government institutions or foundations, NGOs that offer money, then you know an interesting relationship could arise and more students could be benefited. Gerardo, I know you like numbers because you're an engineer. So could you share with us, you know, how uh, is it okay if we talk about like tuition at your school? I can refer to the school I used to work for and tuition at my school used to be uh, $1,000 a month, you know, which is which in a Latin American context is a lot. How, but think about it in terms of our budgets for university. A thousand dollars a month is twelve thousand. So then, how do we suddenly jump from those twelve thousand to tell a parent, "Hey, we're looking at thirty-five thousand, right?" In order for you to be able to access international education, I agree with Ariadna and with Gerardo. Information, like helping people understand, contextualizing international education for parents, counselors, teachers principles is super important. Um, one of the things we can also see is that there is not such clarity in the role of a college counselor. Let's not assume that there is a college counselor in every school in Latin America. We're working towards that, but let's not assume when we, we travel there. Um, uh, Gerardo, uh, what do you think is the role that universities can play uh, by breaking the barriers that affect the vast majority of students all over Latin America? Or I, Ariadna, would you like to tell us about more of those barriers you had in mind, please? Yes. Um, so another barrier I wanted to talk about, um, especially for students in Latin America, is, for instance, demonstrating um, that they have the English language requirement. And sometimes um, you have to demonstrate this English language requirement by showing an international English exam. It could be the TOEFL, the IELTS, Cambridge. Um, and these exams are quite expensive. And sometimes students need to travel um, to the capital of the country to take that exam or to um, or find a way to take this exam. So that adds extra cost. So one of the things that universities can do is uh, implementing um, their own English exam that it could be taken online and it could be done for free. Or another option that we use at our university is the Duolingo, um, uh, which is a, a more economic um, option for students. It can be taken online, it's nice and quick. And we discovered that we could use this um, through the pandemic. So the pandemic um, left this as a good thing. So uh, no, this is this is um, to make it more affordable um, for students. Also, um, 
evaluating students when we are going to admit our students into our programs. It's also important to not only um, take into consideration the student's mark or GPA, um, but also evaluate the student in a more holistic way. Um, what do I, so we have something called flexible admissions in which we evaluate the students by their volunteer experience, by their work experience, um, and of course, and of course the academic experience. So we take this as a whole and then we admit a student into the program or not, because we really value the experience outside the classroom that, that a student can bring and the diversity um, that a student can bring. So if there is a student that belongs to the countryside and has another way of, of doing, so that is that it enriches our classroom. So we accept that student or we admit that student into, um, and into our programs. Another way of breaking barriers um, as university representatives is that um, we promote the online collaboration programs. Um, this is very, um, this we, we are using a lot. So for instance, if we have a student in Mexico or a group of students in Mexico that are taking a program in tourism, and we can also um, have a, a group of students in Canada and take the same program together. Um, this creates so a network um, so amazing. And the projects that can take place in the classroom and outside the classroom and the experience these students have is amazing. Um, we also combine that with exchange programs in which the students in Mexico come to Canada or the students in Canada go to Mexico and in that way they meet and for a week they study together and they finish the program. So there's so much more that can be done and we can reduce the cost of a program by doing it online. So this is another way of uh, breaking those barriers, um, access information, um, access to another culture, another way of learning um, that is also um, more affordable. Thank you, Gerardo and Ariadna. So I'm gonna, and before we go on to the next questions, I'm gonna open it up. If somebody has a question in this audience that you'd like to ask, um, feel free. We have experts in Latin America. So um, if you have any questions right now, please feel free to ask, or if not, we'll continue with our other questions. Somebody, is somebody interested in asking something? Yes, hi. We can hear you, Marty, but and and I, and and I'll tell them what you ask. So no worries, loud and clear. Go ahead. Finishing the process with us. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. And and, and, it, and as a college counselor myself, I could see that, right? The more barriers uh, in terms of the admissions process that we take away from students, the better for them, right? Not this whole very complex um, system. Hi. Yes. Sorry. That was very interesting the way you talked about in the beginning how students and families see themselves with the power of picking the right university for you. So there's a lot of that concept of like the best fit for the student that's gonna serve the student rather than the university saying, this is my acceptance rate, we'll see if you get it. And like, I have that power. So I thought that was a very different sort of form of recruiting. Um, I'm Haiti, I'm from American University. Um, Hi. In Washington. Um, well, but I, sorry, yes. Um, but I had a question about um, kind of the, trends in Latin America in terms of seeing education as an investment. I think that in the, I used to recruit in the U.S. and that sort of notion of investing in a college has kind of gone down a little bit in the 
the, the, um, the value of higher education, the thinking, you know, it's costing too much. Like what are, what do you see in Latin America and students and families? Are they willing to invest in the good education if they see the value in it? Do they see value in receiving an international degree um, more than receiving a national degree in their home country? Okay, head out of the, would you like to answer that question? Yes, not a problem. Um, one of the most important things here is not only that investment that you know you're pointing out, but the fact that it's status uh, and a traditional, a uh, huge traditional part from Latin America is that status. You know, saying, "Well, my my kid's studying abroad. My kid is in the U.S. getting a a, a bachelor's degree." So parents do invest. Parents strategically, you know, save up money. And they will be, you know, trying to articulate with the best university. Um, obviously, one of the important things here, and talking about the two groups that we have mentioned uh, before, is if you're targeting obviously private institutions, you won't have a problem regarding money. I mean, CDS. Okay, talking about numbers, CDS is tuition. Only the tuition is more or less twenty four thousand dollars a year, and the total family contribution for a, C a typical CDS family. Is between forty to fifty thousand dollars, and we have many families that say that you know they can pay sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Do they want to? <laughs> now, I've had many conversations in yeah. which that may change a little bit, and they're looking at other markets such as Canada, uh, UK, Spain. Okay, but that's a different conversation. Now, uh, regarding you know having that international education, oh, definitely parents want that. They're looking for that. And now when we come into the mix of having private and public, public institutions are also looking for that. Okay, something that we haven't mentioned is that although Latin America is, you know, a mixture of different countries and between these countries, there may not be adequate connection. You know, the counselors as a community have been able to articulate groups that help each other out throughout the entire Latin American region. So that is really important, you know, reaching out to the counselor um, and even, for example, here in Costa Rica, as counselors, the, the group works with, you know, other schools, public schools, and we help them out. You know, we have a brother program and we, you know, give tips and we try to articulate, you know, those, uh, those students that may, uh, opt for for international uh you know education for Thanks. me it's really important for for the university reps sorry Lorraine, to understand that they have to be disruptive and one of the biggest problems uh and conversations that i've had over and over is the fact that this disruption this positive disruption comes you know tied or uh it's restricted by a financial situation okay and reps telling me, you know, well, I've had the, uh, you know, the budget, I'd go all around Costa Rica. I enjoy Costa Rica. I'd go to one school, go to the beach, and then go to another school. So it takes that, you know, additional, you know, uh, time to be able to better articulate with both types of institutions and to be able to create these programs. There's where the money comes in uh, because we may need, you know, schools that already have soft landings, foundation years, uh, that better prepare this, you know, this other group to be able to face, uh, you know, uh, in international education. But I've seen, you know, for example, I've seen in rural areas of Costa Rica, for example, really great talent, you know, students that um, they are farmers or they work with cattle and they've developed some sort of system, they've developed, you know, uh, you name it, uh, different uh, products, services, and you just look at what they've done and you're like, wow, if this kid had the means or had other opportunities, this kid would be shining abroad. Okay. So it is an investment. It is status, but you know, there is a gap there that has to be closed. And, you know, that's where the role of the university rep will become really important and groundbreaking. Okay. Because these are the barriers that the reps have to break. Thank you, Gerardo. And, you know, like helping counselors, um, sometimes schools in Latin America will just choose the English teacher as the counselor, or will choose, you know, the psychologist as a counselor who they don't really even have had 
the experience themselves of having a college counselor. So um, we're working towards uh, through IC3 with the Embark program in Latin America. Many other institutions are giving these resources, workshops for counselors and international awareness. We're working to bridge the gap through information with counselors. So I would also want to add very quickly, is there potential in Latin America? I totally believe there is. Is it going to be hard, you know, or harder or more different to, or, you know, reach that uh, potential or reach those kids who have that potential? Definitely. You, you ha you're going to have to invest time and disruptiveness, just like Gerardo said. Um, Brittany, hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Just talking about the, the prestige and status aspect of students choosing to study abroad. Are families looking at career outcomes? Are most students hoping to stay in the country where they obtain their undergraduate degree? Are they planning to come back to Latin America? Just we as the institution, should we be thinking about speaking to them more about what kind of careers are possible post-graduation? Thank you, Brittany. Ariadna, would you like to answer this question, my friend? Yes, for sure. Very interesting questions. And and yes, um, students that usually apply for our programs here in Canada, and I know it's a very similar situation in Australia, UK, Germany, Spain, Malta. Um, yes, they come um, not only to get an education, but to use education as an immigration path. Um, and Canada is very open uh, about this. Um, the Minister of Immigration has said that the, um, the study programs or the study um, way, so the, the way that students can come to Canada to study and then stay and apply for permanent residence is a preferred option for Canada to get new immigrants, especially Canada is a country that relies heavily in immigrants to develop their economy. So yes, mainly students or most of the students that come from Latin America um, to study in Canada, they also want to have the option to immigrate or to apply for what we call the postgraduate work permit. Um, that is a permit that the Canadian government um, gives the uh, international students and allows them to stay in Canada for up to three years once they graduate. And um, then they could have um, the option to become permanent residents and then Canadian citizens. So yes, um, what are we doing uh, as university reps to level this situation? Well, that's something um, we tell the students, okay, if, if you want to have the option to immigrate, then you will have to apply for an on-campus program, for a face-to-face -face program. but um, if you want to go back to your country and contribute um, um, to the development of your country, you can also apply for an online program or for a blended or hybrid um, program that will allow you to get the skills needed um, to continue um, leveling your career and then maybe go back and contribute to the development of your country. Now, when we work with different governments and when the student comes funded by the government. So many of these scholarships come with um, the requisite that the student has to go back to their country and do a project or stay two, three, four years in their country. Um, but for the most part, uh, the students from Latin America that come uh, to Canada or to the institution I represent, they want to stay. They want to stay in Canada and they, at least they want to have the opportunity to work up to three years once they graduate. They might go back at some point or they might have a dual citizenship, you know, work a little bit in Canada, work a little bit in back in their countries. But yeah, they want to have that opportunity as well. Thank you, Ariadna. One of the things I would like to tell Brittany is also, uh, remember that one of the barriers were like the technological differences. 
as a college counselor, my experience was that, you know, aerospace engineering, for instance, beyond the prestige that the student would have, you know, these programs are not available if in some Latin American countries. So it would be very good if you analyze when you visit a country, you analyze which programs are not really um, offered in that region. And or if they are, if they're very new, right, technologically in the region. So um, we're about to finish. I really appreciate everybody's participation. I hope we've done a good job here. Um, what other stakeholders should be involved in breaking the barrier? Uh, Gerardo, very quickly. Sure thing, Lorraine. Uh, well, basically, we've already spoken about the university rep. We've spoken about the family. Uh, we've spoken about the um, the student uh, himself or herself, and an important one is, and this is not a being per se, but is what you know resonated right now. It's the environment. Okay, it's really important to understand what's going on in the country. The diff the countries are different. The needs are different. For example, for the Latin American region, and we'll be a little bit more specific, the Central American region, Costa Rica is really uh, uh, spearheading the the innovation in medical devices and aerospace engineering. So we don't offer medical. Uh, well, we just started offering two universities: one public and one private. One started offering uh, biomedical engineering, and the other one started offering um, aerospace engineering. But it, they just started. So it's really important to understand uh, these differences, th this environment. Panama is really hardcore in the areas of uh, financial services, okay? Uh, Mexico has many services. You got countries like Brazil that have many services. You even have countries that are promoting a lot of innovation and entrepreneurship like Argentina, okay? So it's really important to understand these environments because these environments will also dictate what type of students I will be facing and what is the market that I'm going to be looking at. Thank you, Gerardo. Or even things like the whole concept of a liberal arts education, which might be the right fit for a student. You know, sometimes in Latin America, programs at universities are very, very traditional. Everybody will take the same path. Talking to the students about the possibility of a major and a minor is also a super good idea. Uh, Ariadna, are there any initiatives in the region or in the other regions of the world we could learn from? Yeah, well, I was talking earlier about the um, online learning um, collaboration programs, the COIL programs that can be done uh, from anywhere in the world between um, two regions or among three or four regions. Um, that's something that can be done. Um, also, um, I have we've had the opportunity as a university uh, to train um, students from other parts of the world not them coming to Canada, but us as a university going to those countries and um, our professors traveling. So that's a way of also um, bridging the gap. Um, those are two of the examples I can think of right now. Well, I want to really, really thank uh, Gerardo, Ariadna, and all of you who are here uh, for having this conversation. It's an important conversation. Uh, if you want to participate in the Embark program as faculty, let us know uh, for Latin America. If you're interested in learning more, please feel free to reach out. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Bye, Gerardo. Thank you so much. Bye, Ariadna. Bye, bye Lorraine. Bye, Thank bye, you. Ariadna. Gracias. Logramos. Pura vida, everyone. Pura vida, pura vida, hermano. Pura vida.